I'm coming from Turkey and my research interest mainly is also on Istanbul, how the city is transforming, especially in the recent years. Uh, but also coming from Turkey is a kind of schizophrenic identity, you know, in my part of the Middle East or, or from Europe or from somewhere else. So uh, that's why I find conference for my interest as well is quite relevant. Especially nowadays, okay, we know all these vigorous transformations that are taking place back and forward slowly and sometimes faster because it's our spring, whatever. Uh, but there's also this emphasis on models or references around the world, how this transformation is going to evolve. And one of the explicitly mentioned references is Turkish model. I'm sure you are observing Turkey closely, or the policy makers are observing, or uh, at least you are observing our soap operas. That's for sure. <laughs> Yes, which is understandable. Turkey with its working representative democracy, liberal economy, uh, is promoted actively as a possible model, or at least, as I say, a reference country. Uh, but what does Turkey, Turkey's urban transformation itself, tell us about uh, the limits of this broader transformation debate uh, uh, in the region? So if you look at the transformation from urban perspectives and the question of democracy from the question of urban uh, transformation, what kind of meanings that we should draw upon? That is, that's why uh, the subject is uh, urban frontiers of the Turkish model. So to do that, first I will uh, zoom out just quickly with a bird eye view and maybe with some generalization and simplifications, you look at the region and then come back to Turkey to as uh, uh, low as the neighborhood scale. Uh, just to try this here. Yeah. So, here's the Prime Minister Erdogan and this container, it was an election container for, for the, the last national election in the June 2011. Uh, it was everywhere on, in Istanbul and all around the country and saying that Istanbul is ready and the target is 2023 and say in Turkish let the stability continue and let Istanbul grow so it was striking maybe not so striking when you see these containers alone but I happened to come across uh, all of them in one garage hundreds of them as you see in the sunset, and it was a bit scary. <laughs> Mr. Erdogan is looking at me with the slogan in 2023. Like, wow, yes, it is real, man. This 2023 is coming. And why 2023? It is the 100th year of the foundation of the Republic. You need a symbolic year for a future uh, uh, aim, target for transformation of country through the city. And that was also symbolic in the sense that City transformation was put on the national political agenda as the major election campaign material. So it was the full urbanization of the politics, what I call. Uh, and he said during his election campaign that he has a mad project. He called it mad, madness. And this was like kind of boiling up the the interest of the electorates. What is this mad project? We were reading about the mad project. He was waiting for a certain time, two weeks before the election. And then he happened to tell us the mad project is actually uh, building a canal, like Suez Canal or Panama Canal, but bigger than them. Uh, 50 kilometers long, it's uh, uh, tens of billions of US dollar investment. Uh, together with two new cities, each for two million people, like the one you see there. It's from his 3D animation, so it's a bit hard to recognize. 60 million passenger airport and a new a bridge that would connect two continents. So it was a grand vision for 2023. Uh, and he said during his presentation that this project was kept in secret for various reasons until now. And is the dream of himself and few of his friends. But the dream that was shared 
by, with the past previous Ottoman sultans as well. And uh, he looked at the most popular real estate developer in country, the top 10 richest man, sitting exactly in a room like this, much bigger of course, in front of, right in front of the prime minister. Look in the eye, in front of the cameras, and say, hey Ali, maybe you involved in this project, huh? With a smile. So I think it was symbolic also to show the kind of transformation, how it is happening through these different actors. I mean, this is a real transformation with real people, real actors, real visions, visions for the future. And this vision is not only for Turkey, because Turkey might be a potential model for the region, but for sure it's taking other visions around the region as well. It's a, a two-way process. So this kind of visions for the future, 2023, is not only for Turkey, it's, you know, Cairo has a further region for 2050, it had, maybe it's on the shelf now, but we don't know when it will come again. Mecca 2020, Abu Dhabi 2030, or Amman 2025. I'm sure you all see these kind of what I call urban grant narratives of the neoliberal modernization paradigm, which is valid for the region. It doesn't mean it will happen, but it's there, and it's just shaping our, at least thinking of our cities. And this kind of, I think this putting them together is emphasized this intertextuality of, uh, of the cities in the region, how they are, one city is necessarily should be read in relationship to another. Okay, maybe it will not get there, but change is happening. I mean, it might be a distant future, but we observe it every day through these cranes and the dance of the, 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 the steel and the, the glass buildings rising up. What the Prince Khalid al Faisal told to BBC, he's the Emir of Mecca, you know, this, uh, the, for, for this development, he says skyscrapers are everywhere, not only in Mecca. And for me, accommodating pil pilgrims and making them feel comfortable is more important than preserving a monument. This is reality, and we have to come to terms with it. Emir of Mecca. So I think this, this expression is also really represent the, the, the spirit of, 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 of today. So in this sense, Istanbul 2023 can be considered from the perspective of the global city competition. These cities are competing for the same sources, for the same floating capital, for the same energy that is building up these developments. So the aim is to brand the city with vision for 2023 or 2050, prepare the urban land for investment, develop it, and keep capital flow as long as possible so that as Erdogan states, stability continues and Istanbul keeps growing. But this intertextuality of the cities also signify uh, a kind of decontextualized urbanism. So, Zahadit design for Kartal district of Istanbul could have been anywhere in the region. But also in terms of scale, this intertextuality works because it's not only in, in any cities of the region, but it can be recycled as a Zahadit branded shoe on the left or a Zahadit branded interior design uh, uh, installation. I think without any comment. So these dreams, these dreams are also internalized by different segments of the society in Turkey. The one below is a new project presented by a, another famous developer slash architect saying it's called the Crown of Istanbul. He said he publicly wants to build that. It's 600 meter long tower rising through these, uh, the, this cove that you see. So if, if you look at it from the outer space, it will give the Turkish flag image. You know, so it can be a symbol of national pride and when the tourists came, isn't it enough? This is what he said in, on Twitter directly. Isn't it enough the tourists buy the same postcard for the last 50 years of Hagia Sophia, Blue Mosque, and the historical peninsula? Why not give them something to represent new Istanbul, the leader of the region? Maybe the most naive and in a more sincere example was a previous local election, a, a candidate for a small town, seaside town, from the ruling party, he promotes he promote, uh, promote to turn this small town into next Dubai. And he say, with a little bit of Googling and Photoshopping, he say, why not turn Cheshme into Dubai? Why not? 
And these, these visions, of course, represented in today's Dubai. Today's Dubai is the future of these cities or what they want to become in the future. At least this is how I read the process. Uh, if we kind of, I mean, it's the cities now, we don't develop anymore, of course, in, in case of Dubai, the land, but we are developing the little worlds out of the ocean. So it's uh, maybe a dream that will never come true for others. Uh, if we make a bit of abstraction out of this development, and then I want to move to Istanbul, because this abstraction is made from my perspective, how I see this Dubaiization process in Istanbul. And I call it a seven-star urbanism, because seven-star in Dubai is important, because the hotels, five-star hotels are not enough. You need seven-star. And we see a, a kind of important overriding theme, and you can take them as assumptions as well. There is urban land now considered as an investment opportunity. So when we intervene to the land, we are intervening for preparing it for investment. Uh, there's an emphasis on the iconography, the iconical uh, uh, architecture, design, to at such a scale, you know, that's always more, bigger, and higher, and you tend to forget the very low scale, sometimes informality or sometimes the human scale. And there's this restoration of the, the previous glory, like in the case of Erdogan, referring back to Ottoman sultans, like this emphasis on the heritage, but from a completely different perspective, what Zukin called Disneyfication, taking the transformation as transforming like a, a thematic park. Privatization of the space itself is a, 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 a very important theme and development, and the gating. We already mentioned a lot of gating development taking place, but it's all around the region where the money uh, uh, falls in. And mollification, opening up all these shopping malls. We have made lots of maps on that in the city. It's everywhere without any regulations, any planning regulations, you can open shopping malls without impact on the local economy, uh, etc. So, and the publicness, the meaning of publicness is also radically changing in that sense. And what we see very much car-oriented and water and energy uh, intensive urbanism model. So quickly, from my blogger and maybe activist perspective, apart from the academic perspective, this model itself lacks or not so much pay attention on the ecology, the people, heritage, the publicness, Sustainability in terms of economy, not only ecology, but and the democracy, where I will come right now. Moving back to Turkey and referring this, uh, before moving back to Turkey and referring to this model and Turkish intimate relationship with the Middle East, I just want to show, give two anecdotes and then move into to Istanbul, which I find quite striking. So Middle East in the eye of the beholder or Middle East in the eye of the Turkey, that here the figure shows the, the trade with the Arab states and Turkey, how it changed in the last 10 years. And please see the figures on the right from 2000 to 2010. The balance of trade radically changed in favor of Turkey. This given. It's uh, by far, uh, 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 Turkey is exporting much more than it's buying from the countries of, the, uh, of Arab states. This is in the pocket, I mean by the Turkish National Statistic uh, uh, Unit. And there's a lot of promotion in Turkey that go and export to Middle East, go and invest in Middle East. So this is a, an overriding theme. And uh, the second one, I find it quite striking, uh, a, a quotation from the Prime Minister he, during his visit to Libya, to Tripoli, uh, he, he went and see the, the parliament building of Tripoli right after the fall of Gaddafi. And he said, ah, oh, come on, in Libya, in Tripoli, we want to build a parliament building and the member of parliament shall start serving their country in this new building with the real democracy. So what is important here? He said, we, we want, the Turkish government wants to build this parliament through our mass housing administration, what we call TOKI, which is building all these mass houses. By the way, they, are built, they built in the last five years half million housing units. So the dream of the, uh, in the Kyron case is not impossible. With the model, if you take Turkey, you can do it. But 
It is this kind of development, which I'm not going to so much get into details right now, but we can discuss later. But the idea of democracy is something now you can, you know, export through this kind of developmental construction sector is also, I find, is quite uh, striking. So overall, the city is rapidly transforming and uh, I'm just trying to, how do you, okay, I'm finishing up at the leather, uh, the green one, ah, yeah. So come back to Istanbul, money is flo flooding in, the city is rapidly changing, uh, there's introduction of these new sub-centers, the new canal is going to build right here, the tower you saw, maybe it will be built. Two new cities planned in two sites. New bridge, uh, new airport, another over there with 60 million passengers, etc. Yes, the city is changing. And one of the impact of this change is which forced evictions. At least the threat of forced evictions on many of the informal, but not only informal settlements, but also on uh, formalized neighborhoods. As you see, many dots with different risk of forced evictions. And the one dot that I will focus right now for the last five minutes is going to be this neighborhood, Kosulukle. So, because I think the case itself really has a lot of lessons that can give uh, 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 for the Turkish model itself. Uh, it was a, not an informal neighborhood. But uh, in the city center, next to the, in the historical peninsula, uh, occupied by the gypsy population of, uh, of Byzantine time, then Ottomans, and now Turkish Republic, for the last, some claim, for the thousand years. Some of, uh, of, some of you might already have heard about it, because it's widely written, uh, published case around the world. So the area, the neighborhood, in just next to the historical walls uh, has been designated as an urban renewal area by, uh, by the government. And historically, it was heavily rely on the music and the different culture uh, that, the, that, the, uh, that, that the neighborhood had. And until very recently, there were uh, Entertainment houses run by families where you could go, eat, have fun, pay, and go. So because of these entertainment houses in kind of informal cafes, that the economy of the area was vibrant until 1990, mid-1990s, where these entertainment houses were uh, uh, labeled as immoral and should be closed down. They were all closed down, and rapidly the area uh, fall into uh, deep poverty. Uh, just some facts, I mean, 31% uh, of illiteracy and 8% in overall Istanbul compared to high level of poverty, high level of informal sector, but 80% of the residents wants to live in their neighborhood. That's for a fact. But in 2005, a new law has been passed called Law 5366, Urban Regeneration Law. So uh, to, f up, uh, to facilitate urban renewal, of historical areas which used to be under protection of conservation laws. So with the forced expropriation uh, uh, power introduced, you could directly intervene and, uh, and uh, uh, change these areas. So TOKI, the central agency with renewed capacity, authority, and new mandate, they could speedily intervene and uh, change these uh, areas. So not only in the historical centers, but anywhere informal in the country. So here you see the, the protocol signed by the head of the TOKI, the Central Government Authority, Metropolitan Municipality and the District Municipality to renew the site with the power of the state. So many actors involved. Uh, this was the project proposed for the neighborhood. And the mayor of the area said, this is the most social project that I have ever seen. Of course we are, and when they ask, is it a participatory approach? He says, of course we are, we are implementing a participatory approach. We are approaching owners one by one. Because collective, co collective bargaining was not uh, wanted by the, the government side. So if you have a community-based organization, it was not desired to bargain with the, their uh, uh, collective interest. 
uh, the project itself. So, of course, with the threat of uh, expropriation and the central location and the poverty of the inhabitants, it become a very lucrative investment for well-off citizens of Istanbul, politicians with connections, etc. So right away, the people of Sulukule start selling their rights, their titles, and the owners of the area change uh, rapidly. And there was a process, which I will not get deeper into it, but a five years process of resistance and solidarity with the people, and also pos pos uh, uh, dialogue attempts by various actors. It all started with a party, 40 nights, 40 uh, days, uh, with the local people, with international, national press, all the solidarity groups, uh, to just make, it issue, make the issue a public issue. And there was a lot of attempts of community mobilization and support, so formation of the community organization, formation of a civic initiative called Sulukle Platform, bringing together a group of like this, academics, students, and uh, uh, many of, of the population. There were a lot of academic studies. DPU was there, uh, universities from all around the world went there to do participatory planning activities. So they come up with improvement strategies. Uh, the movement went to EU to discuss that in, at a different level, at a global governance level, because the national uh, 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 doors were closed. You could not really have any kind of dialogue, because the project was so insistently put forward by, by the authorities. Uh, the Sulukula people went to the national parliament, again make it a national public issue. And it's, it's one of the very interesting uh, meeting at the local government. Uh, my time says it's over, so I'm just finishing up. Uh, district municipality invited the people of Sulukule and says welcome the civil initiative platform. But what we know from our colleagues there, it's just the municipal photographer goes there, take the photo, make it onto the local press, and the meeting doesn't really have any tangible results. So, there was two vigorous planning efforts, what we call advocacy planning. First one was participated by 40 academics and students, and the second one, this one didn't stop the demolitions, so 5,000 people, houses were demolished. People were relocated, and they couldn't survive, relocated to the social houses, one of the 500,000 housing units built by the government in the last five years, but they couldn't survive in a newly formed ghetto, come back to the city center. And then, after all this pressure, the new minister of urbanism and the ex-minister, uh, director of the housing, central housing administration, uh, Erdogan Bayraktar, called our colleagues after his TV show. He was presenting the alternative project and saying that this was an inhumane approach to urban renewal. There was an alternative, but the government showed a blind eye. And the guy told us, okay, I watch your presentation, it sounds good, send me your uh, project and let us implement your project. And of course we see the threats, potential dangers in this approach. So we say, let us form a group, go and explain you our approach and let's start the process out of scratch with the people because the, the neighborhood is now demolished. So new plans have been made. Of course, all these people involved, we have to discuss, make a decision if after the demolition we should start planning process again or not. If this is a kind of lip service for the media or not. All these dangers have been discussed. Then we prepare with different working groups, uh, put one month summer holiday many people, including myself, and come up with the end results. Then we go to public, call the public intellectuals and present our pro projects and receive the feedbacks, update it. And then we call the public institutions and civil society organizations, represent it again. But eventually, the project has been built. So the mayor has said, this is the most social project I have ever seen 
in 2006. And then last week, when a news uh, journalist asked him, so what happened to those people of Slukle after these new houses has been finished? This is what he said. Well, we don't know how many of the original Slukle people remained in the project as right holder. We lack scientific research. So science can be a good shield sometimes. So, and as scientists, I mean, I think we all have a responsibility as well to consider. And the houses, value of houses increased tenfold. And two weeks ago, the case was even news in the guardians uh, because of this increase in the speculation. I just want to, uh, wh while I'm uh, finishing, uh, uh, just to say how this happened as a model, how this kind of transformation could have happened. And I think I, I see three ways. Maybe this could be a model for transformation of the Arab countries as well. Uh, change in the executive and governance structure, if you look at it. First of all, the planning process, as you see, it definitely lack any kind of participation. That's in the, uh, for sure. There, and what we see, there was a widespread forced eviction threat, not only in Sulukule, but all around, all, around the, all around the city. And even though it's a working democracy, and there is a local elected uh, bodies, we see the centralization of the local governance through scaling up the planning responsibilities from local level to higher levels, at first metropolitan level and then the ministry level. So if the local democracy stop your plans, by using the democratic mechanisms, you can always take the power into higher level, which is easier to control. Uh, and what we see this market-oriented government reform and formation of professionalized ministries of environment and urbanism uh, at the end uh, facilitate the process. And together with this, there was a pressure on uh, illegalization of the urban social movement. So if you are against this process, you are easily uh, labeled as an illegal civic uh, rising up. So, and uh, this always this urgent need to urban development. We need to improve. These, these are bad working conditions, so we cannot waste time kind of approach. Uh, finally, in uh, legislative, if you look at the legislative, we see the replacement of the legislative processes at the parliament uh, to the government degrees and orders. So urban issues become not the issues of the parliament and the parties to discuss. It is a practical issues that the government itself assigning orders and passing it. I think these are important issues to con uh, keep in mind when we consider democratic reforms. If we don't enhance our democracy question to the urban governance and planning, then there's a big threat while we will think that we are in the newly post-dictatorship uh, uh, era, living and electing our rulers, but eventually the, the benefit uh, of these uh, uh, in terms of urban level, I mean, is it a bunch of men, male, uh, deciding on the, the transformation of the cities after all? Or somehow it communicates with these masses who wants real change? This is the real challenge and the question that I want to finish. I mean, how to make sure these planning processes and power structures are transferred to, to, the, uh, 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 to the masses? Thank you. It's, it's a comment. Uh, I have some concern about those mega projects around the world, especially in uh, the cities that you really referred to. I think that there's some hidden factors behind the political agenda. It's not just symbolism and, and the greatest cities of the world on trying to be developed and so on. I think there is also the price of land, the value of land. The government knows the price and value of land in these parts of the world. Okay. And I know, uh, I was told that Mecca, for instance, is one of the highest prices of land in the world. And uh, at the end, you find that, that kind of encroachment trying to neglect the, the landmark of the, of the initial uh, position of the city. And uh, I think also accessibility is also a, a hidden agenda for the political uh, uh, parties. That they, they know that these mega structures are very well and easy accessible in terms of infrastructure instead of uh, building or trying to plan a new city from scratch. So uh, they could start phases in it, and even if it stops, 
but they started it, and it's, it's, it's a part of the symbol that they're trying to uh, work on. And I'm not just talking about the mega uh, projects, also in informal settlements in, in Egypt, the problem is the value of land. So you have the, the opposite sides, the, the so-called development and the so-called informal settlements. They know the value of land. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Eckhard Rebeck, um, University of Stuttgart. You were talking about the position and the visions of the government on one side and your critical view as an urban activist on the other side. But in, in between is another actor, actor in Istanbul that's an emerging middle class. I think it's a strong social process now, ambitious, consumer oriented and so on. And my question would be, what is the position in all the question you, uh, you uh, were talking about of this rising ambitious middle class in concerning the mega projects, concerning the slum clearance and so on? Mm -hmm. uh, the exit polls after the national election shows that, not in Istanbul, but elsewhere, the most renowned project was this Canal Istanbul project for all the projects that was introduced by the Prime Minister, from health reforms to whatever. That was the most known. It shows, I guess, the kind of aspiration of these also middle class to become the world leader represented on the urban form as well. So many people approve this project, but also some of the segments of the middle class as well questioning, do we really need this investment or first we have to solve some other basic issues? But yeah, I mean, that's why I guess 50% of the people vote for this government. So the middle class is fully supporting. Uh, hi, my name is Mona Helmi. Uh, I'm from Dar al Hikma College, uh, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is not a question, but this is, uh, this is only a comment. Uh, it's maybe early to judge uh, the expansion or the future of Mecca because it's not yet announced. This is one of the plans. What we have seen is one of the plans or one of the projects submitted, but not the final one. Mm. Just I wanted to Thank tell you. you. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, this is Abtahel from the IUSD program. Uh, I have a question for Yashar. Um, you showed a map of um, forced evictions that is going to take place for the master plan of the country. So um, my question is, are there any measures taken by NGOs or urban activist parties or, uh, or anyone else to stop further projects from facing the same um, destiny like the case study you presented it you presented just now or are we facing a theory that says uh, participation is not successful if not supported politically mm -hmm. okay thank you yeah, i mean there are various attempts from the the organized civil society in in the country and m mostly at the resistance level trying to make things public visible but also as you say in the so in the case we really try to produce tangible alternatives just to prove that it is not the only way. I mean, you can really come up with different approaches that make sense, that doesn't evict people. But as the other uh, commenter uh, was mentioning, the urban land determining factor here, so you cannot really change the course. Uh, but I, I think after this uh, uh, vigorous uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, opposition as well, the government is also learning, so they are changing the discourse from uh, uh, evicting, demolishing and rebuilding. They change the language into sharing the urban uh, value. So, like, if it is possible, you demolish an informal settlement on a uh, valuable land and build one tower for the poor and then many tower for the rich. So it could be a self-sustaining, recycled mechanism to transform. In some parts it works. If the building permits allow you to build a 40th floor uh, apartment unit, which happened last uh, week, a new decision. So a, a low rise neighborhood has been agreed fully by the people to be demolished. And there will be 40 uh, uh, floor, uh, 300 housing units in one block for the poor. And the rest will be developed for more hi higher income groups. So I guess we will have more variety of government responses to this uh, uh, the problem. Thank you for uh, all three presentations. Very uh, well connected, I think. 
one way or another. Uh, my question actually came from uh, uh, Yashar's presentation, but reflects on also uh, uh, Glenn's and uh, Regina's presentation. Um, you mentioned, Yashar, that um, leveling up the process at higher levels makes it easier to manipulate. So if the decision is being taken at local level, if it goes to a regional level, it might be manipulated. Having that in hand, and your last two slides, uh, comparing the decision being taken for the benefit of the mayors or the masses, both thinking about them reminds me of a very nice case in Edinburgh. I was living in Edinburgh, and we had a process of participatory planning. Edinburgh is very well uh, confined by the sea and by um, uh, the ocean from one side. Uh, no, I think the sea and the, the other river. And uh, it's very, very limited, very expensive. And there is no space for expansion. And one, once they had a, a hearing in one of the suburbs of Edinburgh, because a, a developer wanted to build a new housing project. And the suburb rejected the project. Um, and the pool for the participation was only residents of that suburb, not Edinburgh. And the reason for them to reject is having that new project will decrease the price of their houses because that will increase the supply. Where on the other hand, Edinburgh was extremely suffering from lack of supply of housing and the only way to expand is to go to suburbs. It opened to me the question, wh where is the catchment? Where should we stop? I mean, here is a clear conflict of interest of two public groups and it's clear that, uh, as Professor Rebik said, it's clear for the public uh, in Turkey that this project is of a priority and they voted for that. Of course, the local has to be considered and has to be fully satisfied of the final decision. But we cannot keep on saying that it has to be taken at the local because we have to say, where does the local stop? Where is the catchment? Where should I stop taking opinions? And these are the people responsible or in charge of giving me opinions because I don't think that participation is a right, but it's also a responsibility towards the group I'm living with and the uh, neighboring groups and the future. I would like to uh, try to pick up a question uh, comparing the three models of democracy we have. I mean, of course, we have uh, the Turkish model and the Indian model and not yet the Egyptian model. So, um, yeah, uh, actually, um, uh, on one side, the Turkish model, in, in the case you uh, just presented, uh, they failed to stop a project. Uh, while the Egyptians, as, as a first step, they just stepped down a regime. So what kind of, of uh, advices would you uh, give to the Egyptians right now uh, to avoid <coughs> some mistakes maybe in both of your models? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for presentation. Uh, this is Ayham from IOSD students, University of Stuttgart. Um, I have one question regarding to the participatory work. Um, if we gathering all this opinion from all the levels that you mentioned, maybe Regina mentioned, talk about, which is international governance and local level, uh, how strong is the local sector will affect on the process, the final step, I mean, in decision making? I mean, as a final uh, result, uh, this, uh, I mean, final, final step should, should take in place, taken into consideration. Uh, maybe we can say there is a percentage, or it depends, <laughs> I don't know. So how, how strong will, will take into consideration the local sector uh, to, uh, in, 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 in the process, in the final process? Thank you. Um, thank you. <clears throat> so we've got an advocacy approach, a grassroots approach, and an approach that's in between, you know, governance and, and participation finding its way. My question is, and I'm a supportive of participatory process, but having been in the U.S. for a while where participation is at the town level, participation also leads to a lot of too much compromise in many cases to the point that plants just sit on a shelf and don't come together. So. I mean, I think it's important for us to understand those limits and see, um, you know, that, that there's that much that can be done, although I'm with that, and, and, and I would like to see, or the opinion of the three of you, how would that be applied 
I want to call it developing or, div you know, towards developed country in that sense. Thank you. Maybe the, the questions were kind of directly directed to all three of you, so you just uh, maybe answer uh, uh, one by one. Uh, Regina, do you want to start? Maybe? Um, I think I can actually more or less answer the last two questions uh, together because it uh, both uh, goes back to how uh, participation in, is happening in Egypt or how is it really applied. I mean, if we look into how participatory processes are really influencing decision making on, on a regional level, we can probably say it's not influencing at all until now. Um, what uh, the experience of GIZ uh, in this field was more that um, uh, the, the community was uh, being involved in certain processes and could influence and uh, articulate their needs and wishes and so on. But at the end, uh, um, when you look at um, the development of the informal areas, very little was happening. So whatever came out, for example, of a participatory needs assessment was maybe... Um, going back to the local level, but uh, it didn't really influence at the end the decision making that say we built a new school or something like this. It ne it, we didn't go to this level yet. Uh, but it, it uh, opened um, more a dialogue and uh, a better understanding of uh, what are, I mean, what's actually there, how can I express uh, uh, my dissatisfaction with something and uh, the community feeling the need that uh, the um, the opportunity of expressing, but uh, really it didn't reach the level yet. Uh, like in Germany, for example, where uh, a society or a, a city or can actually change uh, plans. So I think, uh, and we are very far away from this uh, in Cairo, <laughs> and there are no mechanisms uh, established to. Um, a system where you where you play uh, where what's happening on the local level is uh, reaching a more regional level. Thanks. Um, quite a lot of the questions were around, I, I guess, spatial scale and the limits of direct democracy or direct representation and participation. And um, the the experience within Kerala would be quite interesting here. Um, I think. The way I try and approach this within my work is, is, is not saying, is participation working? It's what work is participation doing? How is it changing structures of power and representation? And one of the things that has happened within Kerala, I think, is that has been a, a localization um, through um, the particular form of representation which is there. Uh, Kerala is quite lucky, though, in that it has a very complicated and complex political society. There are various ways in which different political demands scale up through multiple political parties which are very active, unions which are active, and community organizations as well. And some of these forms, different forms of political society help representation jump scale. Um, it's not always the case in other parts of India's democracy. There are, you know, th th there are differences there, but I guess it gets back to the main point of my presentation, which is rather than try and design the perfect institution at a particular level, we should be thinking about wider processes of political society and ways in which different interests scale up. Um, you know, um, uh, SDI, uh, Shaq's Thumb Dollars International, again, would be one of those kind of interesting examples of where initially very grounded, very community-based um, NGOs have kind of gone into different alliances, sometimes quite problematic alliances potentially, but there are different ways in which you can jump scale. Um, and you know, it's difficult to come with... with uh, <laughs> it's difficult to come with, 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 with particular recommendations which are devoid of a particular context, but you know, in, in Kerala certainly we need to analyse what makes its political society as a whole kind of multifaceted and, and what voices does that allow representation for? So it's, that's not, I hope that's not an avoidance, but it's just a recognition of complexity and the recognition for, for, for context specific answers to some of those questions. Thank you. Uh, with regards to this level issue, um, yes, I mean, it's a broader discussion, this public good and who should decide which level. But 
and what is some call this not in my backyard kind of being against any kind of development, but I think many of these cases, actually we are not talking about uh, you know, further down development that is affecting your land value, but it's actually de demolishing your house and building a house for rich people on the same land. So it is, uh, it's, uh, from uh, uh, what I see, is, should be the decision of these people who are living on that particular neighborhood. And when we say local government and its decisions, we're talking about city of 300,000 people. I mean, district municipalities in Turkey elected for 100,000 people up to 500,000 people. And it's quite a large scale from uh, uh, how I see it. And if you take the, the, the planning uh, responsibility from these bodies and give it to uh, Ankara, the capital, it really takes some steps of the democracy uh, 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 in, in the process. And I have no advice, unfortunately, for Egypt. And I'm hoping to find a model from Egypt to, to see something hopeful for my own country as well, to, for the transformation. But what I learned from, from, from Istanbul and for, from Turkish case, that once you really so much preoccupied by, by this neoliberal uh, uh, growth uh, 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 pressures, and put social justice concerns completely aside, then democracy really doesn't mean much for, for many. And once you emphasize democracy for majority or for the power holder and not really consider the plurality in the society, it's another danger. This is all I can see and say. Thank you. It's a short question for you. Uh, what do you think to create the Islamic left party? in Turkey. Creating Islamic Red Party? Actually... Um, there seems to be a, un, there seems to be an underlying uh, uh, hypothesis in some of the present, particularly in the last one of course, on the uh, comparison of the different uh, ambitious cities in the future that maybe land, land speculation, real estate developers are the major world power and that whatever revolution you preach, um, you're always second. And I'm afraid that, uh, I don't know, but I, I see that uh, many revolutions uh, have not really dealt with that. They're afraid to tackle where the real power is in urban development. One final question? Well, okay, so why don't you answer? Uh, the Islamic left party is actually it's an interesting one. I mean, I, by no means I have any affiliation, but uh, it is happening, finally, because I think it's natural that the ruling party itself is creating its own opposition within the same roots. And now we have these Islamists with more social justice emphasis. And I don't know if a country like Turkey it will have any success. I don't know, but it's happening. Thank you. Maybe two final comments from both of you. Yeah, um, I certainly don't see any uh, major political, I mean, the thinking of, of all of these different, different vision statements, I mean, Vision Mumbai, um, the, the vision statement, uh, this was, um, a, so again, international consultancy firm came in and pro produced a, a vision for Mumbai, and it is essentially class cleansing of uh, the entire kind of peninsula uh, city of, of Mumbai. So, uh, yes, uh, there's, there's rampant revanchist um, elite interests there that are, uh, you know, would be would would be just as powerful within within metropolitan areas with, within in, within India. So, yeah, um, the, the, there was nothing on, on on the slide, unfortunately, that was unfamiliar um, from from my Indian experience. Uh, maybe a more general comment uh, after um, the first round, uh, the first session where um, maybe the general picture now, I'm talking about Egypt, was a bit more pessimistic. I think we shouldn't be too pessimistic about the development in Egypt, even though we don't know where the political development is going. I think if we look at the residents or the people, there is a big enthusiasm in changing um, things. And uh, I think this is... Uh, 
this is very important if you if you're talking about participation in Germany there is a lot of possibilities for the people to participate and there are a lot of people that still don't participate so um, taking the step to participate if you even don't have the possibility I mean by established mechanisms um, I think uh, Egyptians or the majority of the Egyptians is willing to do so and uh, I don't know I have a positive uh, attitude towards uh, changes so maybe uh, Thank you very much. I think our three panelists deserve a round of uh, applause. Um. <laughs>